Okay, what would be a good way of being an ally to indigenous peoples today? And how can I help as someone who's not indigenous? Uh, it's, it, that's actually a really common question. Mm -hmm. this young woman over here asked something very similar. Um, and it's, it, I mean, I think, you know, when, when certainly, I mean, I, I work for the government, so mm -hmm. there's reconciliation at so many different levels. Um, I'm also a lawyer, so reconciliation in, in the law is different, again, than in government policy. Um, and then I think at, at um, individual, I think at, at that level, reconciliation is, is again, um, can be something quite different. Um, but for me, I mean, reconciliation has always been about relationships. It's about, you know, um, talking to somebody and, and, you know, really listening. Um, and, and that can be difficult because, you know, some of the things we hear are very, um, you know, they can be quite heart-rending and um, they can be quite um, painful. Um, certainly in the truth and reconciliation um, circumstances, I mean, listening to, you know, horrific stories about children that were abused by the people that were supposed to be looking after them. Um, I myself am a, I'm a 60s scoop survivor, and, and again, you know, I was raised by a Dutch family where I was abused and alcoholism, etc. Um, so, so part of the sort of um, I think learning that Canadians can can do on a daily basis or on a you know however basis you know however often one can can um, you know allow oneself or or you have the ability to do. Um, I think it's important because it, it is part of Canada, right? And it's part of Canada that um, it, it's like, for me, it's like, you know, if, if I'm walking down the road and I see somebody who has, you know, fallen off their bike and they've hurt themselves, you know, I'm going to stop and I'm going to say, are you okay? You know, is there anything I can do? Can I call somebody? You know, and usually the person is incredibly embarrassed and goes, no, I'm fine, 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 maybe I've got a concussion or whatever, but, but I, think, I think it's the, um, effort to put yourself out of your comfort zone and to say, you know, are you okay? You know, do you want to go for a cup of coffee? Do you want to sit and talk? Um, you know, do you want to share with me something um, that, you know, uh, you think is uh, something that, that, you know, all Canadians or, or just you yourself might, you know, benefit from knowing? Um, you know, I've, I've been privileged to hear many different stories from various people across the world, really. And there's a fellow over there who's, who's come from Syria. And, and I think, you know, there's, there's so many um, touch points where we as human beings, um, regardless of where we come from or, or um, you know, how we were raised or, or you know, all of our you know, phenotypes and things like that, I think, I think there's still those commonalities where, you know, as human beings, we can still establish certain levels of, of, of uh, comfort and empathy. And uh, I think for many Canadians, it's that, you know, almost that, you know, sorry, I don't want to bother you kind of thing, but in some ways, you know, nations are saying, um, we need you to do that. We want you to do that. Um, because that's part of stepping out of the shadows of you know these dark histories that are part of Canada, and and you know um, acknowledging one that they happened, and two that and also you know so there's there's the truth right of the truth of reconciliation, but the reconciliation part that's that's where uh, you and everybody else who is who is you know um, sincerely interested then have to sit with it. You know, you have to sit with those feelings and you have to say, you know, what, what, what is it that I as an individual then can do, right? Well, maybe it's just, you know, when somebody is saying things that are you know, racist or they're, um, you know, they're misinformed or something like that, you can step up and you can say, well, actually, I don't believe that, you know? And, and sometimes it's, it's that sort of um, putting yourself out there that, nudges the progress a little forward, you know, and I have a saying over uh, to these people that, you know, progress is always a little bit forward and then a little bit back, and then a little bit forward and a little bit back, and hopefully the, for the forward progress will overcome the, the backward slide, 
um, so that you do eventually make those incremental steps. Let's see what next question. Over here. Is there any like milestone moments in your life where you felt hope or where you felt empowered? Two. Yeah. Two. Two. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, at different levels, right? I mean, I remember very distinctly, um, I was reliving body memories of abuse. And I, I just felt like, you know, I, I couldn't do it anymore. And I just thought, you know, I'm going to die. And if I don't die, I'm going to want to die. And it was just so overwhelming. And um, it was kind of at that lowest ebb where I sort of heard this little voice going in my head. But you don't have to do it today. You know, you don't have to do it all today. And I was thinking, yeah, that's right. I can have it tomorrow. I can see the next day. And so for me, that was really hopeful because it sort of brought me out of that really dark place. And, um, you know, I have relatives who have, who have not gotten out of that dark place and who have taken their lives and basically you know, said that that was too much. And, um, and I, I have the most profound respect for the struggles that they did. Um, and I'm totally grateful that I had the um, wherewithal and the tools to say, there's it tomorrow and I don't need to do this today. So for me, that at an individual level, that was huge. Um, and, and part of that is, is um, you know, the people I've chosen in my life. The, the help that I've reached out and, and obtained, um, you know, the alternatives that I that I chose. Uh, so, the second question, I'm sorry, was <laughs> we're just saying two milestones. Oh, two milestones. Okay, and I think the other milestone would have been when um, if anybody's watched those videos, it was um, when I um, I went to see my my. Uh, my foster father, who was dying, and um, and uh, because of the abuse in my foster home, I didn't want to see uh, my foster mother. So, so this was her third husband, and so he wasn't there. He wasn't the abuser. He he was just the man who came into my life at a later point in my life and, and uh, showed me basically that you know you could be a father without being sexually abusive. You could actually want a daughter without um, you know in any way kind of denigrating her. And uh, so when he was dying of cancer, I, I wanted to see him very badly. Um, and, but I didn't want to see my foster mom because she was still very much the boogeyman in my, in my psyche. And so my, my older sisters um, and my partner, they brought me to this uh, place in Penticton where, where uh, Ed lived. So Ed is, Ed is my, my uh, foster dad. And, um, and basically, they made it so that I could see him without without seeing them. It was, it was my foster mother, and um, I remember after like it was quite a sort of a you know everybody had to play their part. It was really quite moving, um, you know like Mary, my sister, had to keep my mother, my foster mom uh, busy, and Carol and, and uh, <clears throat> my partner had to make sure that Ed knew where to come, and, and so you know we did get to say goodbye, and. Um, I remember uh, after he did pass a short time later, um, I uh, was sort of thinking about you know when when I'd seen him and, and how I thought you know um, it was such a gift that I got to um, you know see him and tell him I loved him and stuff like that and and, and I brought this to him and, and and that was huge and then as I was thinking about it I was actually sort of thought wait a minute you know. Um, I, I didn't actually bring the gift to Ed, which was my love. But I did, but, but I actually got the gift. And the gift was that my sisters, who had never protected me when I was a child, because they didn't know about the abuse, they surrounded me with their love and their protection from, from my foster mom, who was, who was this, she's like 200 pounds and 5'10", so <laughs> I'm not a big person, but she is. Um, and they, they basically made it possible that I could see Ed and, and really say goodbye to him. And I realized at that point that I got the gift. I got the gift of, of 
my family being able to show me how, uh, what love was and what it, what it could be. And for me, that was, that was really healing. So, so that was a real, um, you know, watershed moment in my life, I think, too, in terms of, you know, being able to say, um, even people who, you know, um, when they were young and they couldn't do anything, can, you know, can do the right thing still. And, and that they can really, you know, show their love in such profound and simple ways as, you know, allowing a daughter to say goodbye to her dad. You have a question there? Yeah. Um, did you find it difficult to reclaim your indigenous identity and what helped you do that? Uh, I, I still am reclaiming my indigenous identity. Um, uh, when I grew up, uh, now I'm 54, you know, I'm not, um, so I really was part of the sort of era when being Aboriginal was a terrible thing. You know, I remember growing up and being spat on, you know, by kids because that was a terrible thing. You know, and I couldn't sit by them on the bus because they didn't want to sit by me um, because I was Aboriginal, right? And it's like, um, so, so part of me didn't want to be Aboriginal because at that time it was really hard, right? It was, it was, you know, I can sort of um, because I'm. I'm Cree, so I'm actually from Alberta. Um, I don't actually look like the uh, Aboriginal peoples up here. Like they tend to be a little stockier and a little, um, um, a little heavier. And um, and so when I grew up, actually, people thought oftentimes I was Chinese, and I knew I wasn't Chinese. <laughs> but and, and it used to upset me because I said, "Oh, I'm not Chinese," and I'd say, "But I don't know what I am because I didn't. I didn't know which nation I came from." Um, and uh, so I grew up basically until I turned 19, not knowing where I came from. So um, when I finally learned I was Cree, uh, I went back to the reserve and I met all of these people who were related and they were like, you know, this is your auntie and this is your cousin and, and everybody spoke Cree and, and I, um, I remember just feeling like a stranger, just hideously, um, like, a, you know, just, just so outside of that community, and um, and so I, I still struggle with that. I think that that's something that um, I've I've sort of had to because I, I don't live in Alberta, so I don't have connections to my Cree community. Um, what I've done, I guess, is is I've kind of um, absorbed, if you will much of the nations that are here in BC, because I was raised in the Solo Nation territory. I worked for the Haida Nation, I worked for the Cowichan Nation. Um, I've, I've you know, known people up and down the coast, and, um, and they've all been incredibly welcoming. And so for me, you know, I identify almost more as a coastal uh, First Nation person than I do a uh, Cree. Um, although I am still really scrawny, and so they don't, they don't, uh, they don't recognize me as, as certainly, um, you know, uh, say a Haida or, or a, a Shinshin. But I, um, I certainly do uh, identify strongly with a lot of the teachings that I've received and a lot of the people that I've met. So in my job as a quality analyst, um, I bring a lot of that to it, and so part of that, um, the, the wonderful sort of synergy is that I get to bring all of that learning and experience into my job and I get to actually um, uh, push forward reconciliation from within the government um, because people don't know what it is and, and they don't know enough about Native culture in order to say, well, that's what it is or that's what it is. And so I can kind of um, help them a lot in terms of, you know, uh, sensitivities and, you know, um, looking at it, sort of, uh, always sort of piping up and saying, well, wait a minute, you know, like there's no First Nation person here, you know, I mean, myself excluded, um, you know, we have to talk to First Nations, you're going to do these things, right? And, and so just those sorts of uh, small sort of messages and small sort of pushes um, really helps in terms of reinforce that, you know, I am Indigenous and I am uh, still part of uh, I'm an indigenous world, so in some ways, I think I've always been a bit of a bridge between the two, and it's a, it's a role that I've 
become more comfortable with. Like I used to, you know, kind of think, gee, wouldn't it be nice if I was on one side of the bridge or the other side of the bridge? Um, but really, being the bridge itself actually is, is not a bad place to be. Do you have a, do you know what you can do to help like bring that spirit back and to like bring that person back into the, themselves so that they can see and like, feel their connection with people and so they, they no longer like, could do action to their harm and others because it's mm -hmm. yeah. Like that. I think what you're asking is. Um, when somebody's in deep pain and basically spinning and they're hurting other people in their sort of environment, how do you bring that person back to a grounding where, you know, their spirit is actually back inside of them and they're, and they're able to, you know, um, be at peace enough so that they're not hurting others? Is, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a very hard question because every individual is so different. Um, you know, I, uh, I have a sister and, and she, she can be quite um, angry and, um, you know, and her anger scintillates in the air and, and it just kind of infects everything and everyone around her and, um, and it pushes people away, which is the irony because, of course, what she really wants is them to come in. Um, what I do with her is, is I... I let her know that I love her. You know, I just say, you know, I don't know what I've done. Maybe I've done nothing. You know, maybe, you know, you're just having a bad day and, and I have really nothing to do with it. Um, but I want you to know that I love you and um, I'll be there. You tell me what you need. And sometimes, you know, she doesn't know what she needs um, because, you know, you obviously if you're in that amount of pain, sometimes, you know, you're, in, you're just kind of like, like if somebody had said to me, when I was at that lowest depth, you know, what do you need? I don't think I could have necessarily put my finger on it and said, oh, well, I need a hug, or oh, you know, I need this. Um, so sometimes space, you know, she, I give her space and say, hey, you know, like, you let me know when, when you know, you want me there. Um, you, you let me know when, you know, uh, when your own sort of um, feelings are too much and you need, you need that person to hold you. Um, now again, I mean, this is my sister, right? I mean, obviously her and I have a history, so she's gonna trust me to the point where, you know, she's gonna say, okay, you know, I'm ready now, let's talk, or what ready now, you know, let's, let's hug. Um, with, with people who are, that you don't know, who are angry, or who are, you know, in that sort of rage where um, you know they're they're so uh, inwardly black blackened by their experiences that they're just like exploding everywhere. Um, what I what I what I do is is, is I send them love, um, you know, and I, I give them as I said I give them a lot of space because I don't want to necessarily get whacked. Um, and uh, sometimes, too, like in my own experiences, I know when I'm revisiting trauma and I'm going through memories, um, one of the tools that I've been given is that you sort of like, like you probably don't know about records, but records, they used to go around in a needle. And if there was a scratch, it would, it would stay on one spot and it would just repeat and repeat and repeat. And so what I like to think of in my head is that I need, I need somebody to nudge the needle so that I get off that groove. So sometimes it's not so much dwelling on what they're going through as much as saying something different where their their focus is suddenly not on this they've got over here. It's like, oh, you know, like maybe it's, uh, hey, what about that movie that we saw, you know? And it's like, oh, you know, or, um, you know, talking about, you know, a really good, um, you know, meal that you shared or something like that. Something to kind of get them out of that repeat I found that helped me quite a bit because it was sort of like, you know, my fixation on it was so um, tunnel visioned um, that I didn't see anything else. Uh, and I, and I, I really needed somebody to say, what do you think about, you know, the cat? The cat is, you know, doing these crazy things over here. And, and so I would go, oh, well, yes, the cat, you know, and I could focus on that for a bit. And sometimes that was enough just to give me a break so that I could then break the uh, cycle. But, it, but everybody's different, you know, like some people, you try to help them and they just get actually angrier. 
Um, I've had that too, um, in which case then, as I said, I, I will send them love, the energy, I will let them know I love you, and I will step back. Because the other thing is, is I know I can't, I can't, uh, I can't heal them. Especially in, um, when in the 60s, so I guess you would have been in, well, your adolescence and then childhood, trying to live and function in a day-to-day -day world that was extra challenging for so many reasons. Um, and then once you were 19 and onwards, what has your journey been like learning self-compassion um, and just building that relationship with yourself? after being in that environment for so long? Well, uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. I think um, it, it took a long time. It took a lot of therapy. <laughs> um, took, took some you know, medications to help as well. Uh, I think for me, it was um, the man who abused me sexually was my stepdad. And um, I'd always been a daddy's girl. And I missed that because my, my foster mom's first husband had left. And so her second husband was a sexual abuser. And I, being eight years old, uh, just saw him as a, a possible father. And so, um, you know, when, when the abuse started to happen, and it went on for quite a, you know, years, uh, I think, you know, when I, when I finally left home and I started to sort of deal with it because, uh, you know, with abuse, either you ignore it, you medicate it, you dull it, or you deal with it. Um, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I never have, so I had to deal with it. Um, part of that was through body memories, as I said, that was sort of the body saying, you know, um, something's happened to you, you have these memories in your body, and you're trying to stop it you are going to suffer these body pains, which basically look like epilepsy, um, and are very hard, um, until you deal with it. And so for me, the self-compassion started when I, when I said, okay, I give. <laughs> you know, I will go get some help, I will go and, and, and um, deal with, with these body memories. I will, you know, um, give myself that, that care. And, uh, I'm not saying that the first therapist I ever went to, you know, I spilled my guts or anything. I, the, the best session we ever had was probably the last one where I knew I was not going to come back, right? That's where I told them all sorts of things. Um, but uh, as I became more trusting of others, and that was a big lesson as well, um, you know, it became not easier, but it became more productive at least. Um, and through that, I learned that one, I, I did actually hate because I thought, you know, it was my fault. You know, I was the one who went and saw him, you know. Um, I was the one who, you know, um, was, was uh, asking to be abused. And I found that to be very, um, you know, the mantra in my head was, you're worthless, you know. You're so worthless that nobody could love you. All you could do is, is merit, you know, sexual abuse or physical, uh, verbal abuse or whatever kind of abuse. And that's kind of the weirdness that was my childhood. And so um, I, remember, I remember the first time I actually sort of realized that I didn't think I was worthy. And, and then my therapist said, you know, if you were your best friend, what would you say to yourself, right? And I just burst into tears because I realized, you know, like, if I was my best friend, like, I'd be telling myself, you know, that it wasn't my fault and that, you know, I was a good person, that I was worthy of love. And that kind of broke the dam of just that whole kind of, uh, you know, feelings of, of hatred and all of that. Now, like an onion, of course, <laughs> you peel off one layer and then you get to a second layer and, and, and you go through another uh, level of, of pain or really Dante's uh, seven layers of hell. But for me, it was sort of, um, it, was a, it was a definite journey towards a place where I'm not a mother, I have a daughter. Um, and uh, she's a well-adapted little person, I, I like to think. She's, she's graduated from high school now. She's, um, you know, she's, she's, uh, uh, she's incredible. I, I look at her and I think, oh my God, you know, like, um, I didn't wreck you. <laughs> you know, 
I really let you just be yourself. And I think to myself, that was because I loved myself enough um, to recognize that her worth, you know? And, and I think that's an important thing. When, when you see your own worth, um, then you see the other's worth. And, and for her, like right from the day she was born, it was just shining so bright, you know? Just her, her incredible essence of, of um, just, uh, I don't know, possibilities, you know, of what she could be and, and um, what she could do and where she could go. And I just thought, how could you not um, love somebody like that, you know? And, and that was only because I could see that in myself. And uh, so, yeah, it's been quite a journey. <laughs>